Well, good morning, family. What a blessing it is to be with you. I feel like I haven't been here for a little bit, but I have. We traveled last week on our family reunion, Sean's family reunion in Alabama. And um, we were grateful to see everybody and grateful for God saving our souls because we continue to get to see what we would be like without Christ. <laughs> so we thank God for the saved and unsaved, and we're believing for the unsaved. Amen. But thank you so much for um, praying for our travel. We got back safely and uh, pray for us because we're getting ready to get on the road right after this service for our leadership conference in Orlando, Florida. Great time. It's every nation. So we get to see everybody from all over the world who comes and um, we just have a great time. So if you could be praying over that this week. Well, Brian did a phenomenal job. Can we give it up for Brian? Not only is he a jack of all trades that can basically fix anything, he's in the midst of getting his degree in theology. And um, we're just so grateful that we can share the practice field with him um, as God continues to use him to, to preach the gospel. But he did a phenomenal job. And this summer is going to mark summer of all summers for you. And you know why? Because we're breaking up with fear this summer. Every last one of us, we're going to break up with fear. So we're giving fear and eviction notice this summer. And if you don't think you have fear in your life, well, just hold on, buckle your seatbelts, because this summer you're going to be able to see, oop, this summer you're going to be able to see how fear has been crouching and hiding behind different things in your life. And sometimes you do what you do because of fear. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you I started to pick it up, but then I realized I should just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. But he came out of Galatians 5, 1 and 2, because we were celebrating, or the world was celebrating, Independence Day. And we get to celebrate dependence. How many of you know we need to be dependent on Christ? I loved his definition of freedom. True freedom is dependence in Christ. And independence from everything that's not Christ. I just love breaking it down, keeping it simple, making it plain. So freedom is all the dependence that we need to do. Thank you on Christ, and I'm going to put it down here because I'll knock it over again, and independent from the things that try to tie and bind us up. Um, he spoke out of Galatians 5, 1 and 2, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Everybody say, Christ has made me free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What does that mean? Don't you go back there. I freed you. I paid all your debt. Don't go back into slavery. Don't go back into debt. Uh, verse 2, behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you are circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And Brian did a great job unpacking the history of why they were talking about circumcision. The Judaizers were basically the Jews who were saved and saying to the Gentiles, you can't get saved unless you're circumcised. Now, for most of us, especially the male children in here, you were circumcised at birth. But men, could you, real, could you just imagine for a minute being circumcised in your adult life? I think that alone would kind of hinder you from salvation. I got an amen on the corner over here. <laughs> amen. <laughs> but they were putting things in the way of salvation for people. And Paul was saying, wait a minute, time out. You don't have to do anything. Christ did it all. So there's no tradition and no uh, anything else a man could come up with for you to step into a relationship with God. And that's exactly what salvation is, a relationship with our Savior. So we're going to come out of um, looking at freedom from fear, 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 7. Now, I, won, I wore my unashamed shirt today. Because that's basically what Paul was teaching Timothy here. Timothy, you need to be unashamed of the gospel. And I'm going to tell you why. It was like four or five times he said it in this text alone. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. So 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. 
As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit of fear, but um, excuse me, God has a, a spirit not of fear, but of power, love and self-control. So when you read the Bible, there's two things, especially when you're saved, that you want to think about the history and the mystery. So the history is who is writing this, who's, who are they writing it to, because this is a letter, what was going on at the time. So we say who, what, when, where, and why. So that's the history of this text. So we know Paul is writing to Timothy, and he calls him son, but we know it wasn't his natural son, it was his spiritual son. Paul was mentoring Timothy in the faith. Timothy was a pastor at the church of Ephesus. Paul and, and Timothy helped Paul establish this church. And then Paul had to go because an uproar happened against him where it was better for him to go than to stay. So he put Timothy in charge of this church in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was like New York or L.A. It was the happening place. Every kind of sin and people you th could think of lived there. And they were called to minister the gospel in a midst of a nation of a culture who did not respect nor believe in God. Isn't that the assignment you want? And so here they are, imagine God speaking to you saying, I want you to move to LA, I want you to move to New York, you're gonna start a church and you're gonna begin to tell people about their sin. Not just minister the gospel, but you're gonna look people in their face and say that's sin. This is basically what Paul was training Timothy to do. Now, when Paul starts this letter, this is one of two letters to Timothy, we, we see he writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. Now, most of us, when we start a letter, it's dear whoever you're writing to. I pray you're doing well, you know, whatever your salutation is. But back here in this culture, especially when you were in the faith, you would pronounce your so-called, or no, I shouldn't say so-called, your authority and your anointing that you're speaking through. So Paul wasn't just saying, hey, Paul or Timothy, this is Paul, your father in Christ. He says, I'm stepping in in an authoritative way to speak to you. So Paul wasn't, you know, uh, puffing up his chest saying, I'm an apostle of Paul. What he was doing was honoring the position that God had placed him in, and he was saying, Timothy, I'm not just coming to you as your spiritual father. I'm coming to you in my position as an apostle, and I'm teaching you through the authority not given to me by man, but given to me by God that you must stay the course. Now, why did Paul feel like he had to encourage Timothy? Well, I'm glad you asked. Nero at the time was the emperor, and half of Rome was burned down. And Nero decided to blame the Christian church, would cause severe persecution. And so all of the Christians were being persecuted and blamed for burning Rome down, basically. And we know it was a lie. They did not do that. But Nero wanted to get rid of Christians anyway. Here's a good way to do it. Have you been, ever been on your job? And somebody unsaved knows you're saved, but they're authority over you. And everything you do cross hairs to them. It's just you, you say hi and you said hi wrong. The emphasis was on the H and not the I. <laughs> it's like nothing you do is right. Well, this is basically where the Christian culture was at the time. Nothing they did was right because Nero wanted them gone. And Paul, because he led the Christians, was the main target. And so he said to Timothy later on, most of the Christians in Asia have left me. And it wasn't so much that they didn't believe in the gospel, and it wasn't so much in that they didn't love Paul, they were afraid. Fear had come on them because of persecution. They were being persecuted not for what they do, per se, or who they are, but what they do, who do they believe in. They were advancing the kingdom. 
Every last one of us in this room who have received Christ as Savior have the responsibility to advance the gospel in our lifestyle, how we work, how we live. You know, you preach sometimes without opening your mouth. And so we are called to be ministers of the gospel, to preach this gospel in season and out of season. Well, the church was discouraged and fearful because they knew that they were being persecuted. And so Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, no matter what, do not give up your post. Do not give up your faith. Do what God has called you to do. Stay encouraged. Now, this is the second time Paul has been imprisoned. He was imprisoned first because basically Nero told everybody he's a troublemaker and we're going to lock him up. There was no crime he did. They eventually had to release him only to lock him up again. And so in the midst of being locked up, he's in the inner prison now, a lot going on, and he's writing a letter of encouragement. What do we do when we are locked up? Is our knee-jerk reaction to encourage someone? Or is it to say, God, you know, I followed you. I did this for you. You know the long list we have for God. I did this, 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 this. How could you let this happen to me? Paul was in such a relationship with the Lord that nothing that he went through did he charge to God's account. He counted it a privilege to suffer for the most high. Now, most of us, I'm going to speak for me, I think I'm suffering when I didn't get the parking spot I prayed for. <laughs> or something doesn't go right in church that I, I would have liked to go a different way. But these saints were being persecuted, tortured, imprisoned for their faith. Really helps us get a different perspective on what persecution is. And so here Paul is on lockdown again for something he didn't do that was a crime. He was advancing the kingdom as we're all called to do. And he's sitting here writing a letter to his spiritual son saying, stay encouraged, be unashamed. Which is why I have my t-shirt on today, unashamed. Now I am shamed about this spot that's on this shirt. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> So he's saying grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. Here he is in turmoil, getting ready to lose his life, and he's saying grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied. I don't know about you, but that has to come from a place and a depth where you just don't know of God, you know him intimately, you know him personally, that no matter what is going on the outside of you, it does not have you imprisoned. You are free and free indeed. Why? Because of what Christ has done for us. You know, when I, I can remember sitting in church, hearing the word, it went one ear and out the other. I just went because my parents made us go. Anybody testimony out there? Your parents drug you to church? I read this article, my parents drug me. <laughs> and then he goes on to thank them for drugging him to church, dragging him to church. But I can remember the moment that God's word activated in my life. And all of the stuff I heard in church became alive for me. So it wasn't that it was the first time I heard it. But when I didn't have a relationship with God, it was just information going out in one ear and out the other. And I was sitting there missing half of it because I'm thinking, what are we going to have for dinner? Will mom let me go out with so-and-so after church? You know, the whole nine. None of you do that here, so I'm so grateful. <laughs> B because y'all have a relationship with him. <laughs> but when, revel when information turned to revelation, these words became alive in my soul. That it was about a relationship. And where am I with God? Where do I stand? And I think about Paul, who was beaten to death a couple of times, stoned out of the city, only to get back up and go back into the city that tried to kill him. And he, he went back to preach the gospel, which got him stoned in the first place, shipwrecked, bit by a viper snake. Shall I go on? And he said, these light afflictions are working for me a far more weight of glory. Wow. Wow. What perspective? How can Paul take all of the bad things that happened to him because he's preaching the gospel? Now, if bad things are happening to you because you're doing bad things. You can't say these light afflictions 
are working for me. No, they're not, boo. You're working for them. But when you're doing right and preaching the gospel and doing what God called you to do and getting persecuted, God says that's to your benefit. And how could Paul say these light afflictions after everything I named? Because he always had the cross in view of what Christ went through. So can we always stop for a moment and compare, is the persecution I'm going through now greater than what Christ went through? Paul always had the right perspective in his suffering. Matthew uh, 31, 11 says, it has been given to us to know the mysteries. So we have the history of why Paul wrote this letter. Now let's check out the mystery. I want to focus in on verse 7. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Now, Paul, again, was saying this to Timothy because a lot of the saints were leaving the body of Christ quickly because of the persecution. They're like, I love you, but I'm out. And the reason we need to know this today about this fear is because, how many you know, the church is being persecuted today. Now, we're not being persecuted as bad as some of our, of our brothers and sisters are. As I shared with you earlier, we belong to a parent church called Every Nation. We have churches all over the world. And some of our brothers and sisters in China and other places, they can't meet like we can. Their church is underground. Some of them who we've, my husband and I had the privilege of meeting, have been imprisoned, tortured, all kinds of things, and God delivered them, like modern day acts kind of stuff. So to sit there and talk to them, it blows your mind that what we read in scripture is still happening today. There are people today being beheaded for their faith. You just don't hear about it on CNN, but it's happening all over the world. At this moment, uh, I had a, um, somebody that I used to pastor in Virginia. She called me, she's a, a doctor, and they were telling her unless she got the um, shot, she was gonna lose her job. But they told her, if you can get a letter from your clergy, we'll honor that and allow you to keep your job. So she has religious beliefs that she didn't want to get the, the shot, and they're gonna honor that. Can everybody say, thank you, Jesus? Because we are getting to a place in culture where more and more we're resisting the gospel and we're setting up things that don't belong to the kingdom of God. And we, the body of Christ, still as Paul was encouraging Timothy, we are called to continue to tell the truth no matter what. And so in the midst of, we have to overcome this fear of persecution. Now, many of us have probably experienced it somewhat especially over the elections, I had more conversations, not with the unsaved. I expect the unsaved to act like the unsaved. What I was shocked about is the conversations I were ha was having with people who claim to know Christ. And I said, okay, well, let's line this up, your, your mindset with scripture, both Democrat and um, Republican. There was no <laughs> bias. I had conversation with both sides. Because I had to remind them, wait, 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 wait. You're picking up a cause and we're supposed to pick up the cross. The cause inevitably always leaves somebody out. But the cross is whosoever will. So when we look as Paul did through the perspective of the cross, everybody benefits. And so we must overcome fear. So I had to, a couple times was reading Facebook posts and I was like, now nah, they know they shouldn't. And some of these people I know, I know they love the Lord. And the Lord said, call them. I don't want to do that, Lord. <laughs> I'm so glad that scripture is in the Bible where Jesus said, if this cup can pass from me. Remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane? I'm so glad that was scripted in there. Because I'd be condemned and convicted if it wasn't. If Jesus said to God, well, look at here. This is my paraphrase. <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> so if there's another way, great. But he also said, not my will, but your will be done. So when the Lord told me to reach out to them, I was like, oh, Lord, please no. Because I just thought about the hard conversations. I'm not afraid of conflict, but it's messy. How many know ministry is messy? Yeah. And I don't like messy. I'm like, Lord, no, just relational mess. I just, it's, it's all good. They'll figure it out. God said, no, call them. You know, when God has you speak to somebody, it's not to convince them. It's to convey the truth. And then you move out the way and you let truth do, do what truth does, 
when it enters someone's life. And so I would have these conversations. Some people were happy that I called. Other people were argumentative when I called. Some people just downright rejected what I said. But how many you know that was not my responsibility? My responsibility was to declare the word of the Lord because that is the only thing that's going to bring clarity, and I can't shrink back. See, I was fearful of what they would say or how they might treat me or where this conversation could go. How many know that's fear? And I felt the Holy Spirit with his hands in my back saying, do not be timid. Be courageous. Do what I've called you to do. Because when we all stand before the Lord, how many know we all are going to give an account? The Bible says we're going to give an account for everything good and bad. Have you ever been in a principal's office? I just imagine that when I look at that scripture. Somebody, that was, was that Brian? That would not surprise me if that was Brian. <laughs> you were there every day, weren't you, Brian? Never got caught. Uh-huh. <laughs> for those in live stream, he said he never got caught. <laughs> But I just imagine that moment. What does it look like sitting before the most holy God? And you can't even say you didn't do it because he was there. (laughs) And if you say you don't remember, I just imagine in my brain. Now, this isn't in scripture. This is just me imagining. Okay? I just think he has like this reel that he can just like hit the the button. And it just plays what, what was said, what was done. Do you remember now? We are going to answer for everything we've ever said or done, good or bad, and we'll get a reward, he said. I don't know what, I don't want to know what the reward is for bad, so let's just do good. But we have to overcome this fear of persecution. And that was the encouragement of the letter that Paul was writing Timothy. You are going to be persecuted for your faith, and you can't fall away like most of the saints have fallen away. He said, they left me. I am here in prison, and they left me. They have gone away from me. You know, we, Sean and I, unfortunately, were, were part before Grace Covenant. There was a church that we went to, and it, and it split. But what was so interesting, it was an unhealthy church to begin with, and we didn't know that, being young in the faith. But what would happen, it was almost cultish. If somebody left the church, then you didn't talk to them. Everybody turned their back on that person. And it always disturbed me because I'm thinking, if they are family, as we say they are, then I can agree, disagree with you and still be family. When something or something, when your body is hurt, do you realize all of the blood rushes to that area? God speaks in natural about spiritual things. We are not to leave each other on the battlefield. We are to rush to the aid of those who are hurt. And so when we overcome fear, we step into maybe this coworker isn't liked and you take them out to lunch. What you doing with him? Didn't the disciples do that with Jesus? Speaking to Mary Magdalene and she had her hair and the oil. Could you imagine, you, Janisha, you walk in and there's ladies at your husband's feet and they just wiping his feet with their hair? <laughs> and you know, bad news travels fast. So I heard a comedian, you know, if if Jesus was married to a woman, because he was married to the church, so he did have a bride. But the comedian said, could you imagine Jesus coming home after that work day? Because you know his wife would have found out before he got home. So how was your day, Jesus? I hear a woman was there to see you today. Her name was what, Mary? And he just went on. It was him. Of course, he made it very funny. But the, the, the bottom line is, do we know God intimately enough where we can overcome this fear of persecution? They tried to persecute Jesus for hanging with Zacchaeus, tax collector. They weren't real popular back in the day. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm having dinner with you. Do we push back from people that aren't really popular in our society? Or do we look at him and say, I'm going to have lunch with you today? Because we have to step over whatever persecution comes our way to advance the gospel and do what God has called us to do. Reach those that are broken, hurt, and lost. We are overcomers. If you've received Christ as your Savior, good news, you're an overcomer. Because Christ is an overcomer. 
And he said, don't be concerned because I've overcome the world. What does that mean? I'm on team Jesus, so that means I won too. So we're going to look at Revelations 12, 11 about overcoming. It says, and they overcame him by him being the enemy, by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. And usually it stops right there when people quote it. But check the last part of that verse. And they loved their lives, not even unto death. Paul was a man that didn't love his life, not even unto death. Esther, if I perish, I perish. We need to have a tenacity about the gospel that when persecution comes, we can respond, if I perish, I perish. There must be a love that we have for God and the kingdom that transcends any fear that the enemy tries to use. What does overcoming mean? It's to hold fast to our faith until death against any of the powers, foes, temptations, or persecutions that come our way. That's what it means to overcome. So God doesn't remove the issue from you to have victory. He puts you right in the circumstance and makes you stare it right in the face and dares whatever it is to move because he is standing behind you. The victory has already been won. So God doesn't put us in circumstances to lose because we've already won. He puts you in circumstances so that you know not just intellectually, but spiritually you're an overcomer. How many of you have been in situations before that would have killed you, but now because you're stronger and because Christ stepped in, your faith is larger and bigger because you've seen what God did on your behalf. Can we just give him a praise for that? I thank him that I'm an overcomer, and I just don't know that intellectually. I know that experientially, but I had to find that out by standing firm in my faith, facing whatever the fear was and saying, you don't have authority over me. I think fear, if, if, if Satan did have a toolbox, I think fear is one of the tools that's used often. It's the one that's all beat up and scratched and looks like he needs another one because he uses it all the time. My husband would tell you, he, as most of you know, he was law enforcement. He worked with an officer, grown man, hip on his side, but if he saw a clown, that was all she wrote. He had a phobia of clowns, and he didn't play. It wasn't like you could just come in there and just play. No, he will shoot you. It's that kind of fear. You ever see somebody that's so ingrained in fear that they will kill you <laughs> if you try to do something like that? So there's things that God releases us from because of Christ that we can stand and look it in the face and not have to be removed for us not to fear. God says, I'm so God, you're going to stand right here and stare at it. Stare it down because I have authority. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In who? So he didn't say in your circumstance. He didn't even say in you. He said in him that you may have peace. So to deal with fear, we must make sure positionally we're in the right place, that we're in him. We recognize it's his authority. It's his power that helps us overcome this fear. He said, in the world, you will have tribulations. Have you experienced tribulations? But take courage. I have overcome the world. So in the midst of tribulation, we're to what? Take courage. Easier said than done. Most of you know my story, lost a baby, my husband and I. That, that, was, that was devastating to us. Have courage in that tribulation. But what we realized is God's grace is sufficient no matter what you go through. And we didn't know that experientially because we hadn't gone through anything. We heard that he was a deliverer. We heard that he'll save. We heard that he'll heal. But it wasn't until we were in that circumstance that we realize that God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he can do. Mother dead at 50, brother killed in a car accident at 30. We've had a lot of death in our family. But I can stand sure-footed and tell you, God is who he says he is. He's a healer. There's nothing that will ever come in your life that will bring you into bondage unless you let it. So I had to take courage in who he is and what he does and how he heals and declare that word over my circumstance. Hebrews 10, 38 and 39, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. 
Do you know God does not take pleasure in us when we shrink back? And that's exactly what I was doing when he told me to call some of my friends. I didn't want to talk to them about this. So I started shrinking back, and God said, take courage. Most of us look for God's presence. How many know he said he'll never leave you or forsake you? You have his presence. The question is, do we have his pleasure? Kids, my kids have been in my presence, but that doesn't mean I've been happy with them all the time. So not only do we want his presence, we want his pleasure. We're going to go on to fear. What is fear? The definition in Webster, an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or threat. Be afraid or of someone or something painful. Threatening, none of us run to that line, I don't think. The word of fear in the scriptures, because you know the Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek, there are 25 words for fear in the Old Testament, 10 for fear in the New Testament. So every time you see fear in scripture, it doesn't necessarily mean it means the same thing. Part of of one is phobia, that's where we get phobias or phobias. And that's where we get the word phobia from. You'll find that in the New Testament. So it's great to study out these words, but this particular fear that Paul is talking to Timothy about is timidity. It's lack of courage. And he's saying, be unashamed of the gospel. Stand up and say what God says to say. So we need to deal with the timidity and the cowardness that's trying to come upon the church even in this hour of speaking the truth in love. Now, how many know the truth is a two-edged sword? I've heard truth about myself and it hurts. It's a two-edged sword. But God said, let not mercy and truth forsake you. So mercy is the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. So not only are we to speak truth to each other, we're to speak it in mercy. Why mercy? God says, consider yourself. There's no separation in sin. Your sin is not better or worse than mine. It's sin. So that's why we can have mercy with one another because we know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah 41, 10, fear not for I am with you. How many of you truly believe that God is with you? You've seen it. Nobody has to explain it to you or prove it to you. Well, he's saying fear not. Why? Because I'm with you. So that if he's saying fear not, that means we have an opportunity to what? fear. So it's a choice. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will withhold you with my righteous right hand. So anytime fear comes, I want you to remember the scripture. God is with me and he's going to uphold me. Everything he promised he's going to do, he's going to do. So we don't need to fear. Now, God has not given us that spirit, so we got to see what spirit did he give us. Well, first one is power, dudamis. That's where we get to derive the word dynamite. That is the inherent power. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves in. So you literally have a power plant in your spirit. So everything that God calls you to do, all you have to do is plug in to the power that is in you, and you can do it. God will do amazing things through you if we just believe and plug in to the power that is not ours, but it belongs to the Holy Spirit that lives in us. We remember in Acts 1.8, he said, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Now fear would tell you, I can't do this marriage. I can't do this health issue. I can't do these relationships. I can't do this work. How many know all of that is the volume of fear? But faith, if you allow faith to replace fear, faith will tell you what you can do. And I don't know about you, but I want people around me that will tell me what I can do. I don't need your help on what I can do. I already know that. Help me know what I can do in Christ. So the Holy Spirit empowers us. 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in just talk. It's power. And that's why Pastor Sean and I have been encouraging all of us, live a spirit-filled life. And when you live a spirit-filled life, the spirit operates through you. So you're out there blessing people, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophetic unctions. You're loving on them in the word. Everybody say, I have the power. power. All right, next we're going to go to, he gives you the the spirit of power, love. 
This love means affection, goodwill. Some of us heard it called agape love. It's really the pronunciation is agape. But it's a love of brotherly love that I can love you like Christ loves you, which means I see beyond who you are and what you do into who God has created you to be. That's the kind of love that God wants us to walk in with one another because that's the love he exhibits to us on a daily basis. So if you struggle with that, just ask yourself, well, how does God treat me? And that's how you treat other people. You love on them. 1 Corinthians 13, I'm not going to read it for time's sake, but uh, verse 8 says, love never fails. 13 tells you about what the biblical definition of love is and how you know it has nothing to do with what the world says. Nothing. If you're falling in love, get up. Because love isn't about falling, it's a choice. That's why the world keeps messing up, because they keep falling. What would you think of me if I came in here and all I did the whole service was fall? You would think there's an issue with me, right? Well, there's an issue with people out in the world that love the way the world loves. I'm going to fall in love with you, then I'm going to fall out. Then I'm going to come over here, fall in love with you, and I'm going to fall out. And then, okay, I'm done with you. I'm going to come in here and fall in love. Love is not a falling. It's a choice. And when we love the way God calls us to love, it brings about the kingdom of God. 1 John 14, there is no fear in love for perfect love. And that perfect doesn't mean without mistake. It's mature love. Mature love casts out fear. Everybody say that. Mature love casts out fear. So when we're mature in love, then it casts out fear. So it doesn't mean fear didn't show up. It doesn't mean fear is not trying to stay. It means perfect love gets that broom and go ahead and kick fear out. It casts it out. For fear has to do with punishment or torment. Whoever fears has not been matured in love. If that's not part of your personal prayer life, I would invite you to make it. Lord, help me mature in love. Love never, ever fails. And then lastly, a sound mind. Can we thank God for a sound mind? Although some people would think I'm crazy, but hallelujah. (laughs) A sound mind. Um, I love the amplified in this um, particular verse, and I'm going to read it for you. It says, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardness or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and love and a sound judgment and personal discipline. That's what a sound mind is, sound judgment. So how do we meter sound judgment from the word of God? Let this mind be in you that was what? Also in Christ Jesus. So we have to think the way Christ thinks, and that's how sound judgment comes about. Abilities that result in calm, well-balanced, and self-controlled life. How many of you want that? A calm, hallelujah, well-balanced and self-controlled life. That's what a sound mind is when we can take the word of God and have sound or anything happening in this world, have sound judgment and have personal discipline about ourselves, which means we're not here, there, everywhere. We are planted. We are an oak tree, planted deep. And nothing that comes makes us uplift and run. No wind that comes can make us fall. God desires each of us to have a sound and balanced life. So what have I said? In the midst of persecution, be unashamed of the gospel. Might be in your workplace, neighborhood, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. What am I missing, Raymond? Y'all know all these Twitters and tweets and Snapchats and this and that, Insta. (laughs) there's Christians coming off of that because they're tired they're shrinking back I don't want to hear it it's confusing and I'm right there with them but what are we called to do are we called to shrink back and the, the root word for being ashamed is to shrink back so what God was telling me is be strong and courageous Joshua step into the middle of this conversation and speak my word Don't take over the conversation, just add to it. What does the word of God say? And people will come back and you'll be persecuted for the word. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to what? Persecute you. So don't think it's strange when these fire trials come about you. 
but I'd rather stand before a living God and know I did what he wanted me to do versus standing and fearing man. There's a scripture that talks about do not fear man who can just harm you bodily, but fear God who can not only harm you bodily, but harm your soul. Church, we are called to advance the gospel in every area of our life. Be unashamed of the gospel. Don't be fearful. And as Paul encouraged Timothy, you encourage one another that God's word stands. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will stand forever. Perhaps you have not stepped into a relationship, whether you're here or online with God. I want to invite you in this moment to do so because without God, there is the spirit of fear. There is no power, there's no love, and there's no sound mind. So we want to give you an opportunity to pray the prayer. Is there anyone here with our eyes closed, heads down, that has not received Christ as Savior and would like to do so? Just raise your hand for me. And if you're online, we would love you to reach out to us. Anyone at all that would like to step into a personal relationship with Christ. Or perhaps you were in one and you broke up with Christ and want to reconnect with him. Raise your hand, we'll pray with you. Because God desires to have a personal relationship and when he comes back, that no one lives in regret. If you're online, please pray this prayer with me if you don't know the Savior. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that the separation between us is because of my sin. I confess that I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Thank you for saving me by sending your son to pay the penalty for my sins. I believe that he died for me, that he rose again, and that he's returning. I want to turn away from everything the Bible calls sin and receive you as my Lord, Master, Savior. Help me to love, serve, and obey you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome to New Life. If that's the first time you've ever prayed that prayer, and if you're in this audience and stepped away from Christ and you just stepped in, congratulations. No condemnation. God loves us all. Hallelujah. Um, if you are online or here, I read the, the prayer out of this book. We would love to bless you with this book free. It's a great uh, tool for the foundations of the faith, lordship, worship, giving, answers all of those questions. We would love to for you to receive that. So there will be people here at the altar to pray if you'd like to pray. And if you're online, please email us at info at and we would love to send you this.